Story eight of Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, nineteen o seven to nineteen o eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, nineteen o seven to nineteen o eight, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Story eight fair exchange and no robbery catherine rangeley was packing up her chum and roommate edith wilmer was sitting on the bed watching her in that calm disinterested fashion peculiarly maddening to a bewildered packer it does seem too provoking said catherine as she tugged at an obstinate shawl strap that ned should be transferred here now just when i'm going away the powers that be might have waited until vacation was over ned won't know a soul here and he'll be horribly lonesome i'll do my best to befriend him with your permission said edith consolingly oh i know you're a special providence edie ned will be up to-night first thing of course and i'll introduce him try to keep the poor fellow amused until i get back two months just fancy and aunt elizabeth won't abate one jot or tittle of the time i promised to stay with her harbour hill is so frightfully dull too then the talk drifted around to edith's affairs she was engaged to a certain sydney keith who was a professor in some college i don't expect to see much of sydney this summer said edith he's writing another book he is so terribly addicted to literature how lovely sighed catherine who had aspirations in that line herself if only ned were like him i should be perfectly happy but ned is so prosaic he doesn't care a rap for poetry and he laughs when i enthuse it makes him quite furious when i talk of taking up writing seriously he says women writers are an abomination on the face of the earth did you ever hear anything so ridiculous he is very handsome though said edith with a glance at his photograph on catherine's dressing-table and that is what sid is not he is rather distinguished looking but as plain as he can possibly be edith sighed she had a weakness for handsome men and thought it rather hard that fate should have allotted her so plain a lover he has lovely eyes said catherine comfortingly and handsome men are always vain even ned is i have to snub him regularly but i think you'll like him edith thought so too when ned ellison appeared that night he was a handsome off-handed young fellow who seemed to admire catherine immensely and be a little afraid of her into the bargain edith will try to make riverton pleasant for you while i am away she told him in their good-bye chat she is a dear girl you'll like her i know it's really too bad i have to go away now but it can't be helped i shall be awfully lonesome grumbled ned don't you forget to write regularly kitty of course i'll write but for pity's sake ned don't call me kitty it sounds so childish well bye-bye dear boy i'll be back in two months and then we'll have a lovely time when catherine had been at harbour hill for a week she wondered how on earth she was going to put in the remaining seven harbour hill was noted for its beauty but not every woman can live by scenery alone aunt elizabeth said catherine one day does anybody ever die in harbour hill because it doesn't seem to me it would be any change for them if they did aunt elizabeth's only reply to this was a shocked look to pass the time catherine took to collecting seaweeds and this involved long tramps along the shore on one of these occasions she met with an adventure the place was a remote spot far up the shore catherine had taken off her shoes and stockings tucked up her skirt rolled up her sleeves high above her dimpled elbows and was deep in the absorbing process of fishing up seaweeds off a craggy headland she looked anything but dignified while so employed but under the circumstances dignity did not matter presently she heard a shout from the shore and turning around in dismay she beheld a man on the rocks behind her he was evidently shouting at her what on earth could the creature want come in he called gesticulating wildly 
you'll be in the bottomless pit in another moment if you don't look out he certainly must be a lunatic said catherine to herself or else he's drunk what am i to do come in i tell you insisted the stranger what in the world do you mean by wading out to such a place why it's madness catherine's indignation got the better of her fear i do not think i'm trespassing she called back as icily as possible the stranger did not seem to be snubbed at all he came down to the very edge of the rocks where catherine could see him plainly he was dressed in a somewhat well-worn grey suit and wore spectacles he did not look like a lunatic and he did not seem to be drunk i implore you to come in he said earnestly you must be standing on the very brink of the bottomless pit he is certainly off his balance thought catherine he must be some revivalist who has gone insane on one point i suppose i'd better go in he looks quite capable of wading out here after me if i don't she picked her steps carefully back with her precious specimens the stranger eyed her severely as she stepped on the rocks i should think you would have more sense than to risk your life in that fashion for a handful of seaweeds he said i haven't the faintest idea what you mean said miss rangeley you don't look crazy but you talk as if you were do you mean to say you don't know that what the people hereabouts call the bottomless pit is situated right off that point the most dangerous spot along the whole coast no i didn't said catherine horrified she remembered now that aunt elizabeth had warned her to be careful of some bad hole along the shore but she had not been paying much attention and had supposed it to be in quite another direction i am a stranger here well i hardly thought you'd be foolish enough to be out there if you knew said the other in mollified accents the place ought not to be left without warning anyhow it is the most careless thing i ever heard of there is a big hole right off that point and nobody has ever been able to find the bottom of it a person who got into it would never be heard of again the rocks there form an eddy that sucks everything right down i'm very grateful to you for calling me in said catherine humbly i had no idea i was in such danger you have a very fine bunch of seaweeds i see said the unknown but catherine was in no mood to converse on seaweeds she suddenly realized what she must look like bare feet draggled skirts dripping arms and this creature whom she had taken for a lunatic was undoubtedly a gentleman oh if he would only go and give her a chance to put on her shoes and stockings nothing seemed further from his intentions when catherine had picked up the aforesaid articles and turned homeward he walked beside her still discoursing on seaweeds as eloquently as if he were commonly accustomed to walking with barefooted young women in spite of herself catherine couldn't help listening to him for he managed to invest seaweeds with an absorbing interest she finally decided that as he didn't seem to mind her bare feet she wouldn't either he knew so much about seaweeds that catherine felt decidedly amateurish beside him he looked over her specimens and pointed out the valuable ones he explained the best method of preserving and mounting them and told her of other and less dangerous places along the shore where she might get some new varieties when they came in sight of harbour hill catherine began to wonder what on earth she would do with him it wasn't exactly permissible to snub a man who had practically saved your life but on the other hand the prospect of walking through the principal street of harbour hill barefooted and escorted by a scholarly looking gentleman discoursing on seaweeds was not to be calmly contemplated the unknown cut the gordian knot himself he said that he must really go back or he would be late for dinner lifted his hat politely and departed catherine waited until he was out of sight then sat down on the sand and put on her shoes and stockings who on earth can he be she said to herself and where have i seen him before there was certainly something familiar about his appearance he is very nice but he must have thought me crazy i wonder if he belongs to harbour hill the mystery was solved when she got home and found a letter from edith awaiting her i see ned quite often wrote the latter and i think he is perfectly splendid you are a lucky girl kate but oh do you know that sydney is actually at harbour hill too or at least quite near it 
i had a letter from him yesterday he has gone down there to spend his vacation because it is so quiet and to finish up some horrid scientific book he is working on he is boarding at some little farmhouse up the shore i've written to him to-day to hunt you up and consider himself introduced to you i think you'll like him for he's just your style catherine smiled when sydney keith's card was brought up to her that evening and went down to meet him her companion of the morning rose to meet her you he said yes me said miss rangeley cheerfully and ungrammatically you didn't expect it did you i was sure i'd seen you before only it wasn't you but your photograph when professor keith went away it was with a cordial invitation to call again he did not fail to avail himself of it in fact he became a constant visitor at sycamore villa catherine wrote all about it to edith and cultivated professor keith with a clear conscience they got on capitally together they went on long expeditions up shore after seaweeds and when the seaweeds were exhausted they began to make a collection of the harbour hill flora this involved more long companionable expeditions catherine sometimes wondered when professor keith found time to work on his book but as he made no reference to the subject neither did she once in a while when she had time to think of them she wondered how ned and edith were getting on at first edith's letters had been full of ned but in her last two or three she had said little about him catherine wrote and jokingly asked edith if she and ned had quarrelled edith wrote back and said what nonsense she and ned were as good friends as ever but he was getting acquainted in riverton now and wasn't so dependent on her society etc catherine sighed and went on a fern hunt with professor keith it was getting near the end of her vacation and she had only two weeks more they were sitting down to rest on the side of the road when she mentioned this fact inconsequently the professor prodded the harmless dust with his cane well he supposed she would find a return to work pleasant and would doubtless be glad to see her riverton friends again i'm dying to see edith said catherine and ned suggested professor keith oh yes ned of course assented catherine without enthusiasm they didn't seem to be anything more to say one cannot talk everlastingly about ferns so they got up and went home catherine wrote a particularly affectionate letter to ned that night then she went to bed and cried when professor keith came up to bid miss rangeley good-bye on the eve of her departure from harbour hill he looked like a man who was being led to execution without benefit of clergy but he kept himself well in hand and talked calmly of impersonal subjects after all it was catherine who made the first break when she got up to say good-bye she was in the middle of some conventional sentence when she suddenly stopped short and her voice trailed off in a babyish quiver the professor put out his arm and drew her close to him his hat dropped under their feet and was trampled on but i doubt if professor keith knows the difference to this day for he was fully absorbed in kissing catherine's hair when she became cognizant of this fact she drew herself away oh sydney don't think of edith i feel like a traitor do you think she would care very much if i if you if we hesitated the professor oh it would break her heart cried catherine with convincing earnestness i know it would and ned's too they must never know the professor stooped and began hunting for his maltreated hat he was a long time finding it and when he did he went softly to the door with his hand on the knob he paused and looked back good-bye miss rangeley he said softly but catherine whose face was buried in the cushions of the lounge did not hear him and when she looked up he was gone catherine felt that life was stale flat and unprofitable when she alighted at riverton station in the dusk of the next evening she was not expected until a later train and there was no one to meet her she walked drearily through the streets to her boarding-house and entered her rooms unannounced edith who was lying on the bed sprang up with a surprised greeting 
it was too dark to be sure but catherine had an uncomfortable suspicion that her friend had been crying and her heart quaked guiltily could edith have suspected anything why we didn't think you'd be up till the eight thirty train and ned and i were going to meet you i found i could catch an earlier train so i took it said catherine as she dropped listlessly into a chair i'm tired to death and i have such a headache i can't see anyone tonight not even ned you poor dear said edith sympathetically beginning a search for the cologne lie down on the bed and i'll bathe your poor head did you have a good time at harbour hill and how did you leave sid did he say anything about coming up oh he was quite well said catherine wearily i didn't hear him say if he was intending to come up or not there thanks that will do nicely after edith had gone down catherine tossed about restlessly she knew ned had come and she did not want to see him but after all it was only putting off the evil day and it was treating him rather shabbily she would go down for a minute there were two doors to the parlour and catherine went by way of the library one over which a portiere was hung a hand was lifted to draw it back when she heard something that arrested the movement a woman was crying in the room beyond it was edith and what was she saying oh ned it's all perfectly dreadful i couldn't look catherine in the face when she came home i'm so ashamed of myself and i never meant to be so false we must never let her suspect for a minute it's pretty rough on a fellow said another voice ned's voice in a choked sort of way upon my word edith i don't see how i'm going to keep it up you must sobbed edith it would break her heart and sydney's too we must just make up our minds to forget each other ned and you must marry catherine just at this point catherine became aware that she was eavesdropping and she went away noiselessly she did not look in the least like a person who had received a mortal blow and she had forgotten her headache altogether when edith came up half an hour later she found the worn-out invalid sitting up and reading a novel how is your headache dear she asked carefully keeping her face turned away from catherine oh it's all gone said miss rangely cheerfully why didn't you come down then ned was here well edie i did go down but i thought i wasn't particularly wanted so i came back edith faced her friend in dismay forgetful of swollen lids and tear-stained cheeks catherine don't look so conscience-stricken my dear there is no harm done you heard some surprising speeches so you and ned have gone and fallen in love with one another oh catherine sobbed edith we we couldn't help it but it's all over oh don't be angry with me angry my dear i'm delighted delighted yes you dear goose can't you guess or must i tell you sydney and i did the very same and had just such a melancholy parting last night as i suspect you and ned had to-night catherine yes it's quite true and of course we made up our minds to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of duty and all that but now thank goodness there is no need for such wholesale immolation so just let's forgive each other oh sighed edith happily it's almost too good to be true it is really providentially ordered isn't it said catherine ned and i would never have got on together in the world and you and sydney would have bored each other to death as it is there will be four perfectly happy people instead of four miserable ones i'll tell ned so to-morrow end of fair exchange and no robbery recording by noel badrian county offaly ireland